Hey guys, welcome back to Games of War. Today's episode is going to be going back to a specific moment in time that I lovingly refer to as Mascot Hell. And I use the term lovingly because this is a certain time period representing the early 90s, mid 90s. It's a thing that will never be again. I highly doubt in gaming we will ever go back to a highly competitive genre of mascot platformers. I think it had its place in time. And I could be wrong, but I think that time is over. Uh, sure, consoles, they still have mascots to this day. Uh, you know, Xbox has got Halo, Master Chief. Uh, Sony has got maybe Nathan Drake or maybe Ratchet. Uh, Nintendo will always have Mario and its secondary characters, but none will be competing at such a high level that forces other companies to try to jump into the ring and provide their own mascots to take on it and get a piece of that pie. So I hope you guys enjoy, and thanks for watching. All right, guys, in my opinion, the mascot craze all started when Sonic the Hedgehog hit. Now I'm not saying that Sonic the Hedgehog is the original mascot or is the first mascot game ever. All I'm saying is that Mario was already established, he was a popular figure, but Sega released the Genesis, Mega Drive, what have you, and sure Sega had a few uh, mascot attempts previously, Alex Kidd, maybe a few others if you consider Opa Opa or some other obscure characters, but when Sonic the Hedgehog was developed, he was developed with one purpose in mind, and that was taking on Mario, giving Sega a face. And what a face this was. Sonic the Hedgehog is the reason the Genesis started selling well. They took the fight to Nintendo, and Sonic the Hedgehog is actually the reason that Sega outsold Nintendo after the Genesis was released. Uh, the Genesis was first released, and it wasn't doing that all that well, to be honest. I mean, it was selling well, but when Sonic hit, man, that was it. He brought something new to the table. He brought speed blast processing but the most important thing that he brought was kind of this notion of attitude sonic made being a video game character cool again and it was something that mario didn't bring to the table and in the early 90s there was like a lot of attitude everywhere there was like the attitude era in wrestling and there was like just this whole feeling of attitude and, and sonic somehow brought that so this character really got nintendo back into the game and it was a fierce war man sonic uh, the, like I said, the Genesis started outselling Nintendo, and when the Super Nintendo was released and Super Mario World came out, it was on. It was war. So other companies saw the success that Sonic was having in Mario, and they said, hey, you know, let's create a character and jump into this, uh, this mascot. Let's jump into this platformer genre. Let's make some money. Was it a success? Oh, man, it was a flooded market. Let's take a look at some of the good and some of the bad of the mascot hell era. And one thing I want to get out of the way real quick is let's establish what I consider to be secondary characters. Now, secondary characters might be like a mascot, semi-mascot. Like Toe Jam and Earl had some pretty uh, big acclaim back then. The first game was very well received, and there was a sequel. And they kind of appeared as ads and Genesis ad, you know, as advertisements for Genesis games, and they were featured on like console advertisements. But these were, I always looked at as secondary characters that weren't trying to replace Sonic as like a mascot or a spokesman for the console. These were popular secondary characters often featured alongside Sonic. Same concept with Echo the Dolphin, another excellent secondary character created by Sega, spawned a couple of successful games. He was an instant recognizable character for Sega, but was never trying to uh, go at Sonic as being a mascot or replacing. And even to a lesser extent, one-off games never got a sequel. Games like uh, Decap Attack, Chuck D. Head was an awesome character, uh, Kid Chameleon, or even Chacon. Uh, these guys are all in this Sega stable of characters, but they're not mascots. So now that we have defined secondary characters and why they don't apply to mascot hell, I also want to cover just a quick basis on where I stand. These are also mascot platformers, but I don't consider them in the mascot hell vein because these were not characters that were created as a quick cash in to try to jump in on the bandwagon and, and ride some of that mascot success. They're all mascots, yes, they're all platformers, yes, but these were all previous mascots that have been around forever. They just happened to be in a platform game and representing the different companies' mascots. You know, Cool Spot, Castle of Illusion, Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, you know, Ronald McDonald, McDonald's. These are all previously existing mascots that are just a platforming game on the system. So these were not created to try to cash in, so therefore these are exempt as well. All fantastic games, by the way. Starting things off on a positive note, of all of the mascot characters, mascot hell, uh, heyday from the 90s, 
Arrow the Acrobat was always one of my personal favorites, and I wasn't alone in this aspect. I think if I remember right, an article in EGM, they actually named Arrow like the best new video game character of 1993. So fundamentally from a design standpoint, he was a good looking character, and he just you made it made you want to play his games. He was a, a night there were some pretty bad you gotta remember, there were some pretty bad designed characters, some ridiculous ducks, I saw a few uh, skunks, I saw a few devils, I there was some pretty bad stuff. Arrow was created by David Siller, who actually went on to create Crash Bandicoot and I believe Maximo uh, from Capcom on the, on the PlayStation. So he had some good uh, momentum behind him, good people behind him. Uh, Arrow the Acrobat was developed by Iguana, uh, published by Sunsoft, which if you saw the Sunsoft logo on a game, nine times out of ten you were going to get a quality game. Uh, so Arrow the Acrobat, the first game, you're introduced to the character. Arrow is a bat, obviously, with some human qualities. He is part of a circus troupe. And the plot line is that there is a clown who has been fired from this troupe. I think his name was Edgar Ector. I, I think it was Edgar Ector or something like that. He's fired from this troupe and basically is pissed off and wants to uh, get this troupe shut down, shut down the circus. So it's up to Arrow to thwart this guy's plans. And along the way, uh, he's got a sidekick named Zero, so Zero's a bad guy in the Arrow of the Backerbat games, and I thought he was an awesome bad guy. I thought he'd make a great game, and my, my wishes came true, oddly enough. But uh, a 2D platformer through and through, Arrow of the Acrobat, is a really good game. It's got the circus motif running throughout the first game, really good music. I chose the Super Nintendo versions because I grew up playing these, but it turns out that was a good thing because the graphics look better in the Super Nintendo versions. It's also available in the Genesis. Uh, better graphics, better sound, and uh, the, the first game sticks to the surface troop, and there's a lot of cool gameplay mechanics going on in here. You're going to be launched out of cannons, you're going to be platforming. He has a special uh, diagonal drill attack, which is really cool uh, for hitting enemies diagonally, up, down. Uh, you can jump, you can shoot stars, limited. Uh, really tight controls, a really cool character to play as. I really enjoyed the first Arrow of the Acrobat. Uh, the mechanics are you know, highly playable still to this day. It's a lot of fun. But the second game is where the series really started to shine. And uh, this opens up uh, out of the circus environment. It opens up to bigger levels, massive levels. You have a new attack where you can use still the sideways diagonal drill. But this is like the drill dozer where you can go straight down. So you can jump up, straight down, hit enemies, and chain it into the diagonal attack. So it, it's pretty uh, a cool, robust attack system. You can also still throw the stars um, limited. You have the different levels in here where you can ride on snowboards. Uh, a lot more variety to the levels in the second game. The graphics are better, lots more uh, frames of animation, and the graphics do look better, better music. Just a, a very well done sequel. Uh, if all sequels could improve the way Arrow the Acrobat 2 did, maybe some of these mascot games would have fared a little better. But uh, a fantastically plain series. It looks great. The character's cool. Great music. Uh, Level design is what makes these games, and these were a lot of fun to play. Uh, the mechanics were spot on, there was no sloppy jumping, no problems with the hit detection, there was cool ways to attack, so I'm a big fan of this series. And the spin-off game, I actually wish I had the Super Nintendo version, because once again, like these, uh, it looks better on the Super Nintendo, sounds better on the Super Nintendo, but this, I gotta say, is one of the best 16-bit platformers uh, ever made, and that's, that's like a bold statement, but... Zero has got so many different ways to attack enemies. He's first of all, he's a he's a ninja squirrel. He's very limber. He can bounce around. And he can jump and do flips and zip across the screen. And he's also got this dive and swoop mechanic where he can jump up in the air, kind of dive down. He's like a flying squirrel, so he spreads his arms and kind of flies down. Then you can press the button left in his button and you soar across to, uh, to the side, and then you can shoot back up. So it's like a three mechanic swooping technique, all done with button presses. It's a little tricky to master, but once you do master that dive, swoop, and rise mechanic, it's a lot of fun to use, and a lot of the levels are built around that mechanic, so you could take diving leap off of platforms, fly down, swoop over, and swoop back up, and land on different platforms, and get into hidden areas. Uh, you can also like acrobat around the screen, and, and do jump kicks, and you've got nunchucks, and you've got throwing stars. Level design, once again, spot on. It's like they took everything they learned from the Arrow games and put it into Zero, uh, very colorful game. Music is awesome. Once again, the Super Nintendo version, I, I much prefer it to this, but it, for some reason, I guess not for some reason, but the Super Nintendo version of Zero is super expensive, man. It's it's crazy to get a complete copy. I, I will get it one day, but the Genesis version still is a lot of fun. 
Uh, so if you're after a mascot platforming game from the 90s, one that's not like terrible and really playable, this series still holds up well to this day. I believe they ported these to the second one or the first one to the Game Boy Advance like in the early 2000s, but after that it disappeared until I believe these games showed up on the virtual console back in like 2010, but ever since then just nothing, it's done. So uh, this is a great series to go back in time and play, I love the Arrow the Acrobat games. Rollo to the Rescue is a cheerful, pleasant little platformer from Electronic Arts, who, by the way, Electronic Arts may have a bad rap today. I think they got voted one of the worst companies a few years back or a year ago. On the Genesis, they were killing it, man. They released such a wide variety of games, and Rollo was from Electronic Arts. And this was, a, a, for me, a game that my dad brought home for me, and we ended up playing this together, and he loved this game. And I, I would had as much fun watching him play as, as I did play. And I was really young then, and this was just a bright, pleasant game. Very cheerful, happy. Even though the story is kind of depressing, young Rolo, a baby elephant, was kidnapped by an evil McSmiley and forced to slave and work in his circus. I mean, that's awful. Uh, you get freed one day. You, you free yourself and you make an escape, and as you're going through the forest, you start running into your animal friends that have also been captured, put in cages by McSmiley with the idea that they would be forced to work in his circus as well. So you as Rolo, your job is to find the keys and free your animal friends. Now after you free these friends is when the gameplay hooks start to kick in. You free your rabbit friend, you can take control of the rabbit and now you can bounce super high and reach areas that are way up in the trees or hidden areas that Rolo couldn't. You've got squirrels that can climb any surface that Rolo couldn't climb. You've got the beavers who are expert swimmers and you've also got the mole who can dig underground passageways and find hidden items that way. And the hook of this game is that once you unlock these characters out of the cages, they follow you and you can switch on and off at will to any character for any situation that might present itself in these levels. And it's a lot of fun, man. I, this game does not get enough love. Uh, it's, it's charming. It's such a colorful, uh, cheery game, uh, pleasant music. And the levels themselves are pretty big, and it's really cool using these different animals' abilities to help clear the levels, puzzle solve your way through, if you will. And I thought that the map system where you unlock pieces of the map and it gets bigger was brilliant. Uh, great level design. I can't say enough good things. You know, this game is not going to challenge you to the death or have you pulling your hair out in frustration. It's a nice, whimsical, uh, joyful ride through a colorful world. Uh, very nice uh, sprites, the animals look great, it's fun playing as the different kinds of animals with different abilities. So if you're looking for a nice pleasant uh, platformer that came out in the mascot days that uh, didn't get enough love, definitely check out Roller to the Rescue, it's a fantastic game. Next up on the Genesis we have a Sonic clone through and through. And most of the times I'd say that's kind of a bad thing. Socket, it's not a horrible game, but it's just that it bites off a of Sonic so hard it's just like come on is this really the best you got I mean in terms of being a functional game totally functional graphics are great that runs at a very brisk fast speed there's no slowdown or any problems like that uh, you play as Socket who is like a future duck uh, there's an evil time dominator who has can built this device that is capable of going back in time and he's screwing all kinds of things up so you as part of like the time control or whatever uh, you're a future duck and you are sent back to destroy this device to stop this time dominator. So you run through these levels really fast, uh, reminiscent of Sonic, very reminiscent, other than you must charge yourself up uh, and you must collect these little lightning bolts to keep Socket uh, full of juice so he can continue to run fast. Every time you're moving or you're taking damage from enemies, your, your meter's going to go down, so you need to continually keep yourself charged, which sounds like more of a pain in the ass than it really is. It's really not that bad. It's not hard to find these little lightning bolts. There's plentiful supply. Uh, his means of attack is a kick. You can kick and you can like kick upwards, which seems to work pretty well. I've had fun playing this game. It's it's colorful. It's it looks good. It's got good music, and it's it's fun to play. And one of the problems that I had with like Sonic kind of games and even some Sonic games, not so much the old ones, but you get running so fast, so fast, and then you hit an enemy and you're brought to a standing still, grind to a halt, and you start running again. You get hit. This doesn't have the enemy placement where it's like super annoying where you're running fast and all of a sudden you get hit out of the blue with an enemy you didn't even see and you're stopped to a halt. It, it doesn't have too much of that going on. So when you get going fast, it's pretty much a smooth ride. And the level design, like I said, is, is pretty good. Uh, I don't have too many bad things to say about Socket. That It's not highly original and the character is kind of like a, a doofus looking Daffy Duck reject of some kind. 
But as a game, take it for what it is, I've definitely played worse Sonic clones. So if you're looking for something on the cheap that definitely tried to cash in on Sonic's speed and whole vibe of you know a speedy platformer, this is definitely a ripoff, but you could do worse. It's not that bad. Before we move on to other consoles, at the risk of sounding redundant, because I have talked about Rocket Knight Adventures and Sparkster many, many, many times, and Rise Star many times as well, I just want to mention these games because I'm doing a platformer video, Mascots, and these are both mascots, and they are both just phenomenal games, examples of characters done right. Uh, Rocket Knight Adventures and Sparkster, and Sparkster on the Super Nintendo are all fantastic games. My favorite will always be the original Rocket Knight, as I've said before. Uh, you play as Sparkster, he's an opossum, he's got a jetpack, he's got a sword, you can rocket through the levels, you can hang from your tail. Amazing platforming, this is an awesome character designed by Konami. If you're looking for some of the better mascot platformers up there with the Acrobat and stuff, this is a phenomenal series, uh, great character, excellent games, all three of them. And Ristar, Ristar, is a sad tragedy of coming out too late, sadly. He came out in late 95. Everybody had moved on to 3D gaming and new consoles, and this character, bright, beautiful. People that say Genesis has a limited color palette, which it does, and many games showed that. This game, you would not know that. Bright, beautiful. Rystar's an awesome character with stretchy arms, and he can catapult himself through the levels, using his arms to grab enemies, knock them out with his head, and use just beautiful platforming elements, great level design. This game does not get enough praise well, it doesn't get enough praise, it, it doesn't get enough attention, or it, it didn't get the proper love due to the timing it was released. But I, everybody that plays this game knows that it's amazing. I couldn't do an episode without talking about it once again. So these are definite mascot platformers that are thumbs up, double thumbs up, excellent games. Before we move out of Sega territory, we're going to look at the Sega CD. Now this is a console that sorely was lacking a mascot. Now sure, Sonic at this point was still alive and kicking. He hadn't had a bad game yet. And Sonic CD is my favorite Sonic game personally ever made, and a lot of people love this game as well. So Sonic was alive and well at this time, and I, I guess he could be still be considered Sega's mascot at the time, and he had a great game on the Sega CD, which is more than I can say for the 32X, technically, Knuckles doesn't really count, but and the Saturn. Saturn never really had an original Sonic game, so I, Sonic was still alive and kicking, but the Sega CD could have used like a cool secondary character to Sonic to represent the platform and give it kind of a voice, because it was still was prevalent at the time, and mascots sold. What we have for a platformer representing the Sega CD, there's Flink, but I'm not going to dive into that because it originated somewhere else. Wild Woody. This is what we got for a mascot for the Sega CD. Wild Woody, yes. And this game sounds just as bad as the name applies. Now, in this you play as a pencil uh, in an office. This guy, Dusty, is an adventurer. He comes back after finding this totem Something happens, the totem uh, separates, shatters, and you see these totems flying to different paintings, opening different worlds. The final low man of the totem pole uh, brings the pencil to life, Wild Woody. And what follows there is you going into these worlds that have been activated through these totem poles and trying to reassemble this and save the totem pole. And this game, you know, it's pretty awful, I must say. The music is just horrible loops over and over again. And to play as a pencil, it's about as exciting as it sounds. You use your ass to wipe out enemies, that's right. You attack enemies by rubbing your ass on them, jumping on them and erasing them. You can access secret spots and levels by rubbing your ass on the wall. If that sounds like a great time, um, definitely check out Wild Woody. Uh, I think he'd be a, a, just a swell mascot for Sega in the Sega CD. Uh, no, no, this game is kind of a joke and it's, to be honest, playing at this today's day, it's, it's kind of more of a comedic novelty because, I mean, this idea was so outlandish. Did they really think this would be successful? Did they think this character would be taken seriously or, or do well? No, this is a platformer mascot that is thankfully stuck in mascot hell. This guy was just wrong to begin with. It's wrong watching him rub his ass on different things, and it's just overall just a, a debacle. Not a very good game. The 32-bit generation brought about a lot of changes for mascots and platformers in general. 32-bit brought on the 3D era, and all of a sudden, 2D gaming was not cool anymore. Everybody wanted to play the brand new 3D games, which posed a lot of problems for platformers. The early platformers were really difficult to play with camera issues and 
a really weird spacing issues. You never knew if you're going to make the jump. It was just the whole perspective was thrown off. Now, thankfully, there were some amazing characters and, and mascots for the PlayStation. Uh, everybody knows Crash Bandicoot and Spyro. Unfortunately, these original developers sold off the rights to the characters and gave them to new companies, so the newer games weren't as good. But everybody has heard of Crash and, and Spyro on the PlayStation, so let's dig into some more. These are examples of platformers done right on the PlayStation. Let's dig a little deeper. Enter Punky Skunk, a 1996 platformer from Jalico which uh man what to say about this it has gorgeous graphics the graphics are bright colorful it looks like something out of the 16-bit days just bumped up a little bit everything looked great animations great punky skunk is kind of a bad name and the character himself is not so hot in it you play as punky skunk who must save the world from an evil wolf pack now the hook to this game is just like your old 2d platformers that you remember running jumping controls are okay but in this game, you're going to be using your skunk spray, you're going to be getting a pogo stick, inline skates, all different kinds of gameplay elements to try to spice things up a little bit, riding snowboards and such. Now, Punky Skunk, something just feels kind of off in this game. I don't know what it is. It's, it's not a bad game. It's not, sure isn't great. The character himself is really kind of lame, and this game overall did not set the mascot world on fire. Quickly forgotten. You often see this guy showing up in some of the worst mascots uh, from the 90s and PlayStation era, so proceed with caution. Next up we've got Jersey Devil, and I was going to talk about the Croc series, Croc Legend of the Gobos, but you know what, there was a couple games from Croc, and Jersey Devil I think is a more interesting character. I actually really like the character design of Jersey Devil. The problem with this game is the problem with early 3D platformers, camera issues, perspective issues and this kind of really kind of ripped off uh, Crash Bandicoot a lot uh, just not nearly as good. Your primary mission in Jersey Devil is to stop Dr. Knarf and mutated vegetables and this is all from memory. I, I remember it being really kind of silly and cheesy in terms of a story. There's six main areas in this game with three levels each and Jersey Devil can jump. He has like a spin attack that has a sound effect ripped right from Crash Bandicoot and he can glide. And there's some problems with the gliding. It should be a lot easier than it is in this game. You know, I really liked this game when I was a kid, and I had fond memories of it. And I, I've talked good. I've talked well about this game. You know, going back recently and playing it, it, it just doesn't live up to what I remembered it being. Uh, some of the levels, well, you have to collect Dr. Narf. You have to collect and spell the name out before you can proceed to some areas, which is really kind of annoying. Uh, the jumping just feels off sometimes. It's got a big problem with perspective in this game where you never feel like you're going to time the jump just right in, in virtual space in 3D to land on platforms. So it really suffers from early 3D platforming issues. Uh, the camera is a pain in the ass to keep moving around. And Jersey Devil doesn't control nearly as good as he needs to for precision platforming and jumping. The gliding feels really off. So I sound like I'm being really hard on this game. and. It really hasn't aged that well, but it's still kind of a solid game in terms of, you know, I do like the character and it's got the right idea, just some things are definitely wrong with this game. He's definitely been forgotten. Some of those problems I described with the early 3D free roaming kind of platformers are really what drew me to games like this, like Toomba and Klonoa. Now these games were 2.5D and this was a, something that was brand new on the PlayStation and even Saturn is that it's a 3D game but it's running on a 2D plane and it really allows for some really cool graphical effects and stuff that I had never seen before. Planoa is a really magical game you know, taking place in like a dreamland where you're running along and you're jumping on enemies, grabbing them and using them to platform yourself up higher. I thought Planoa was a really cool character. The graphics were just, for the time, just beautiful. And I thought the stages were really well designed, very colorful. And I really enjoyed that 2.5D. Toomba is kind of similar, but it's a very different kind of playing game. This is like a, a you know 3D, but on the 2D rails. But you get to certain points, and you can jump up into the background or uh, go different ways. And there's the way this plays is different. It's not like a you know from right to left game. There's all kinds of like side quests and side missions, and doing all these different little tasks throughout the levels. So it doesn't play like a from left to right, get to the end of the level, go on to the next. There's all kinds of different stuff to do while you're in the level, and tons of different side quests, tons of different tasks to accomplish. So it's like a giant collection of mini games within levels. 
and it's you know top-notch graphics and uh, the, the production value is through the roof. The scenes, animated cutscenes, everything works really well in both of these two games. I really thought that the breath of fresh air that 2.5D brought to this new generation of gaming really meant something. It was fixed all the camera problems of an open 3D game and it was just a magical experience. At the risk of this video going on for far too long, I want to give a couple quick shout outs to some honorable mentions. I absolutely love the Jumping Flash series on the original PlayStation in terms of being just an amazing platformer that brought something completely new to video gaming. When I had played this, I had experienced Vertigo for the first time in a video game. Jumping in this little robot rabbit suit way high up into the air and then falling and descending on platforms. Top notch stuff. I absolutely adore the Jumping Flash series. Medieval is awesome. I love the kind of ghouls and ghosts ish kind of vibe going on. And it's just a, a great series of games to, to get into. Uh, great controls, great environments. Definitely check out the Medieval games. Uh, Sir Daniel is a great character that's kind of been forgotten in the PlayStation lineup of characters. Moving on to the Saturn, it was a really interesting time to be a Sega fan at this point. They had kind of burned people with the 32X, and the Saturn never got a proper Sonic game. Sure, we had Sonic 3D Blast, which is like a port of a Genesis game, nothing new. Sonic Jam, which is merely a collection of past Genesis games, although this did have a really cool 3D open world to run around in. This is really the only way to see Sonic running in 3D on the Saturn, unless you consider Sonic R, which was Sega's attempt at making kind of like a Mario Kart running um, racing game style on foot, uh, love it or hate it kind of game, absolutely love the soundtrack. But we never did get a proper new Sonic game, and the Saturn was left to try to use new characters for mascot type games and what we got was Bug, Bug 2, Clockwork Knight, and Clockwork Knight 2. And sadly, I don't think these characters have held up very well. Bug and Bug 2, you know, Bug's trying to be like a movie star, so the game you play is like you're on set. And this game is really unique for the time. As the game started off, you're on a, you know, it looks like a 2D game. You're walking along, Bug, 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 and all of a sudden, the entire camera and the entire screen just shifts and there's a third dimension going back. And I'll admit, the first time you see that, after coming from 16-bit gaming, is pretty damn impressive seeing Bug with that perspective uh, switching. However, unfortunately, the rest of the game can be really frustrating. The levels go on for far too long. Uh, the sequel tries to fix things by adding some new characters and some, some more variety, but I don't know, Bug just didn't work for me. It, it didn't back then. I, I've grown to like it a little more nowadays, but I remember, I think it was Spielberg or somebody big from Hollywood, played Bug and I guess his kids loved it so he was like behind it all the way, he wanted to turn it into a feature film and do all this advertising stuff. Obviously nothing ever came of it and Bug has been forgotten in mascot limbo. Uh, Clockwork Knight, kind of the same thing. It's a 2D game but it has like a real CG look to it and the main character whose name is way too long to pronounce, just something didn't feel right. They were okay games, the controls were alright, but I didn't really care for the graphical style, and these characters as mascots just didn't do it for me on the Saturn. Sure, they're remembered fondly by fans, and this does these both do have their fan bases, but it just wasn't up to standard for me for Sega. So I guess the closest thing we'll get to an official mascot on the Saturn is Knights into Dreams. And this game is fantastic. I absolutely love this game. Uh, this is far from forgotten. Knight still lives on. He hasn't had a real proper game. I'm counting the Wii version as, as an okay uh, entry, but he was resurrected on the uh, PSN and Xbox Live Arcade, an HD version, so you can still experience Knights. He's still around there. Maybe someday we'll get a new proper game in the series. As an honorable mention, I just got to give a shout out to Astal. I've talked about this game many, many times before. Uh, I guess you don't have a lot of faith in your guy if there's no label on the spine to even differentiate it. It's just a blank. But a stall was a bit of magic when I first played this. I picked up the Saturn and this was the first game that I experienced and I just thought that this was 2D gaming brought to the next level. Still a visual treat for the eyes. A stall is a stunning game, stunning backdrops, just a very beautiful look. Uh, gamers did not care about this, it was ignored. And it's just now getting the recognition it deserves. So I've talked about this game many a times, but definitely he could have been a cool little mascot for Sega and for the Saturn, but he's no more. For some honorable mentions on the Saturn, we've got three games, different characters in each game that are no longer with us, sadly. I've talked about Three Dirty Dwarves, Mr. Bones, and Scud before in the past, so I don't want to 
go back over that, but just know that they're out there. Three Dirty Dwarves, excellent hand-drawn 2D three-player game. Mr. Bones, amazing variety and levels. Cool character, guitar player. And Scud, an awesome assassin. So if you want some mascot love that sadly is no longer with us, check these games out. They're great. Now when the Xbox hit, it was the new kid on the block, and they already had a massive hit with Halo, and Master Chief had become their mascot, their spokesman for the console, but Microsoft felt that he was maybe too violent for kids and for you know a mass audience, so Blinks was created, and this was supposed to be kind of Microsoft's mascot. Now the first Blinks was pimped as like the first 4D game ever, I guess because you could control the flow of time, I don't know. Uh, I actually kind of enjoyed the first game. You play as Blinks, who's a time sweeper, who works for this time corporation, and their job is to monitor glitches in time, and if there's a problem, the time sweepers are sent to dispatch. However, the Tom Tom gang is up to no good, and they are creating rifts in time. They end up kidnapping Lena, and Blinks springs into action to help save her. Uh, this game has you going through levels and defeating a certain number of monsters, these time monsters, to progress. And all the while you're using this TS-1000, I believe it's called. It's like a Luigi's Mansion ripoff thing where you just hold this kind of vacuum. You're able to suck up trash and fire it at enemies. And the hook of this game is collecting crystals. You collect a certain uh, few sequence of color and you get the ability to pause, fast forward, uh, record, and do all these different time manipulations to kind of puzzle solve your way through these levels. Uh, the first one was received pretty averagely it got some positive reviews and it was okay however the sequel in my opinion was really awful i got this one and didn't play much of it at all so i can't comment too much on it it's just something turned me off from it back then and i haven't really taken much chance to play it since i know i did not like what i played and this second game was not well received so this kind of ended blinks's chance at xbox mascot stardom it didn't stop at blinks we've got some more platformers attempting to give birth to great new characters, mascot quality. And so, fortunately, it didn't happen. Uh, Voodoo Vince was not too bad of a game. I actually kind of like the New Orleans feel. Uh, there was a, a voodoo lady who got her shot broken into by a couple of local blundering robbers. Jeb and Fingers, some great names. They end up destroying the shop and kidnapping uh, the voodoo lady from her shop, Madame Sh Charmazel, I think her name was, or something like that. And I remember they kidnapped her and some of this dust that they were after, this magic dust supposedly that gives this woman her powers, got sprinkled on a voodoo Vince and he comes to life. And you are able to play as this little guy, he's like a burlap sack, 10 inches tall or something. You go through levels and you're able to inflict pain on yourself and this in turn inflicts pain on your enemies. Uh, he's got some standard attacks like jumping, a spin attack, punching. But I remember the voodoo powers being pretty cool in this game. The level variety was really cool. There's lots of vehicles to drive in this. I thought it was pretty well done. It received mixed to positive reviews, and Voodoo Vince wasn't all that bad. Uh, now, Torque was... I remember this when it came out. It was late in the uh, system's life, and it was done by the Rayman 2 team, I believe. And he was like a shape-shifting kind of little caveman guy. And I don't remember if it was uh, like a Yeti or an Armadillo or like a Flying Squirrel. It had some, some shape-shifting abilities. And the graphics weren't too bad. I just remember having really high hopes for this game because Rayman 2 was brilliant. And this one just didn't really come through in the way that I thought it would. The character design is okay. And it's got some solid platforming. But unfortunately, these games just weren't enough. They weren't enough to elevate it into territory where we could remember these characters. Never got any follow-up games. So Voodoo Vince and Torque are both long forgotten into the world of mascot limbo. I hope you guys enjoyed taking a look at some of the forgotten mascot characters. Honestly guys, I've got enough here that I didn't talk about that I could go for a part two, part three. So if you enjoyed this series, let me know in the comments. Uh, Games of War is back. Uh, it's taken some time to get through some stuff. I've got a lot of stuff going on in real life, man. And I, I love doing these videos, but like this is a time-consuming hobby, man, doing these videos. So I've got a couple of collection videos coming out. Those are real easy to push out, and I love talking about... Uh, the library of games and, and giving some recommendations so look for that stuff in the future guys as always games of war is absolutely nothing without you